Welcome to Dhaka Tribune Presents Straight Talk, one-on-one -on -one conversation with newsmakers and opinion shapers. I am Zafar Subhan, editor of Dhaka Tribune. Today my guest is the celebrated Pakistani author Muhammad Hanif. His first novel, A Case of Exploding Mangoes, was long-listed for the Man Booker Prize, shortlisted for the Guardian First Book Award, and won the Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best First Novel. His second novel, Our Lady of Alice Bhatti, was shortlisted for the 2012 Welcome Prize. In his third novel, Red Birds, has recently been published to universal acclaim. Welcome to the show and welcome to Bangladesh, Muhammad Hanif. Thank you for being here. My first question is, what brings you here to Bangladesh? And how does it feel being here in Bangladesh as a Pakistani? I know it's not the first time you've been here, but I'm sure, you know, coming to Bangladesh is perhaps a little bit different for you than going somewhere else. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, and I'm uh, honored to be here uh, as a part of uh, Dhaka Literary Festival. Yes. And uh, I was, uh, when I was coming from the airport, I was remembering uh, that I was here uh, six years ago. And, uh, and it was lovely uh, meeting the people, meeting other writers, uh, meeting lots of uh, uh, students. And uh, I live in Karachi, which is uh, sort of probably as, as big and uh, as populated a city as Dhaka. I would imagine and, so. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I was wondering one thing that struck me was uh, that Dhaka uh, is as lovely as it was, uh, even probably more beautiful than it was six years ago. Uh, but one thing that I noticed, the one thing that hasn't changed is uh, the traffic. And I think that reminded me of uh, Karachi uh, a bit uh, as well, that you can be in a car and you can be sitting uh, in a traffic jam and there comes a moment when you start to realize that you are never ever ever going to get anywhere. Yes, I mean, I think I would have to say as a long-time den denizen of Dhaka, mm. that that's probably the biggest challenge we face. <laughs> One of these days, I think that, you know, I'm going to walk out of my door at mm -hmm. home and I'm just going to see a sea of cars literally taking up every inch mm -hmm. of the road surface there is. And I think that is the one challenge we face. But uh, other than that, it's not so bad. It is uh, lovely. I, in fact, uh, I've uh, been wanting to come. And apparently, the only reason uh, the only reason that you can come to Dhaka is that you have to uh, write a book. So I had written a book uh, seven years ago, yes. and I was invited to Dhaka, and it has taken me seven years to write another book. And uh, here uh, I am again. So I hope that uh, next time I won't take that long. Uh, I will write another book, uh, and I will be uh, back in uh, Dhaka and spend some more time here. Well, hopefully it's not going to take you having to write another <laughs> book to get here. Hopefully we can bring you back to Dhaka on another uh, for another reason. But tell us a little bit about your latest book, Red Birds. It has uh, recently been published. It has received a great deal of critical acclaim. Why don't you talk us through it a little? Yes. What uh, I can tell you is that, uh, mm, that I started writing it seven years ago. It's a book about a family which is uh, kind of living in a refugee camp uh, in a slightly post-war period. Yes. And I think in a way we all live in societies where we've forgotten that there's a war going on uh, literally sort of in our uh, backyard right. uh, because we have our own uh, comfortable uh, lives. We kind of do our uh, TV lunches and dinners and we kind of take our kids to schools. If we have our dogs, we take them for walks, we do picnics. And while we're doing all of that, uh, there is a war uh, going on and the background to it could be and it only occurred to me after I had finished the book uh, that the year I was born was the year 65, 1965 ah, of course, and yes. there was a war uh, between India and Pakistan and then when I was in started primary school there was 71 yes. and the day I took my matric exam uh, Soviets invaded uh, Afghanistan. And that war started, the Afghanistan war started uh, when I was s starting high school. Yeah. And now my son has gone to university and that war still goes on. Yes. And it has replicated itself in, in many other parts of the world. There's, there's Syria, there's, there's Kashmir, there's Yemen. And there are, God knows, many other places that we don't even know about or we haven't even uh, heard about or as journalists we don't even cover them because they're so distant. Yes. Uh, so it occurred to me one day that one constant theme of my life or my generation's life uh, has been 
uh, these wars that kind of rumble on and then we get so used to them that we forget about them. But obviously there are people who grow up uh, during these suffer. wars and, and it's, they, it's they their suffer. everyday life. Yes, and, uh, and it's not all about suffering. Uh, it's uh, that they have a life. That's they're, right. They're, how do they, they live? How they do have, they mediate They have aspirations. Times, yes. What do they laugh at? Uh, how does their, their economy work? So I think the book kind of tries to deal with uh, those kinds of issues. But basically, it's, it's a family story. It's about, it's about how humans love each other, how humans love animals, how we become uh, enemies, how we kind of want to destroy each other and sometimes yeah. uh, can't. Uh, so it it kind of I think tackles those kinds of uh, yeah. uh, uh, slightly ridiculous themes. I think. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think you've gained a reputation of being a sort of quote unquote political writer. But I would suggest that perhaps you didn't set out to be a political writer. You were just trying to write about you know the world as you see it. And as it turns out, being you know a Pakistani author of a certain generation, mm. politics somehow seeps in to what you write about. It's hard. It's a hard subject to avoid. And you think that. That's a fair characterization of your work? Yeah, sometimes whenever I start a book, and this is my third attempt, when I start a book, I sort of because as journalists, you cover yeah. kind of, you know, all kinds of bizarre, bloody stories every day. Sort yeah. of people dying, people becoming homeless, people disappearing, people being arrested and tortured. That's like almost a kind of, you know, uh, our that's, bread and butter. That's, that's so, so when you kind of sit down in the corner to uh, write a book, so sometimes I imagine, try to imagine a world yeah. uh, where mm, nice things are happening, mm. Mm, happy things are happening. I sort of tell myself that, okay, nothing bad is going to happen uh, in this book. And then by the time I get to page 12, somebody dies or somebody disappears or somebody kind of breaks someone's heart. Uh, so It's unavoidable. So the, the real world kind of uh, crashes into yes. our... Uh, whatever whatever kind of fictional I ideal world uh, we are trying to uh, trying to create and uh, so as a result you become you know sort of what you said a political uh, uh, writer uh, because you live you breathe politics you, well, you've inherited you have, you've thing, inherited you it yes yeah people mm. can't avoid politics I mean I think pe perhaps in other mm. parts of the world you have the luxury though I suspect even in other parts of the world, that luxury, that space is shrinking. You have mm. a, the luxury of being non-political. But of mm. course, in our part of the world, I don't think people have that luxury because politics actually affects their everyday life. I mean, people are living so close to the surface, you could say, that uh, these things matter to them. Yes, because it, it matters. It affects their day-to-day uh, -day life. It, it, it impacts how, uh, mostly, I think, what it does mm. to you is, as, as somebody who has children, is that it makes you aware that there is a world that you've kind of inherited and there's a world that you're going to leave to your, your yes, children. Yes, absolutely. And all those decisions that, uh, that were made before you or being made now, you're part of those decisions. You, you might not agree or not. Is How it, is, is that is in Karachi? Because that's one of the things we're missing in Dhaka. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Dhaka used to be this gorgeous city. I mean, I'm glad you said mm -hmm. you found it still very mm -hmm. beautiful when mm -hmm. you're here. Mm -hmm. But I remember the Dhaka of the 1970s and 80s, which I grew up in. Mm -hmm. Green spaces everywhere. It was absolutely marvelous. And, you know, we've gained a lot, but we've, of course, lost a lot. How's Karachi I, I as think, far as I think that that that's goes? the curse of our generations as yeah. you grow older and you look back and everything looks uh, bigger and beautiful. <laughs> but I think we were small then. We were little kids. And when <laughs> You're a little We're child. When you're a little, a little child, little, huh? like even like a tiny park seems like a you know sort of a huge <laughs> uh, uh, jungle. So sure. I, I I think uh, uh, I think there's a bit of that going on. No, we just drove past an absolutely stunning uh, lake, which and that's I, Hill, yes, That's right. That's and that's relatively yes, new. And, and, and it last is time I was here, things in Karachi were pretty bad. So I was at a public park, which was full mm -hmm. of young people sort of some playing randomly playing music others kind of you know just 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 partying as, as young people should yes. and I was so struck I said oh my god that does not happen in Karachi uh, any more uh, and but it used to once upon a time it used yeah. to but things change so now it's happening again, again. so I, I sort of take my my young son to a park and the park is full of uh, you know sort of kids and other parents and and old uncles like me kind of you know trying to well, do their jogging now, trying, to do, <laughs> trying to do their uh, uh, jogging kind of uh, uh, runs yeah. uh, so i think uh, 
we, yes, I think one thing that happens with having young children is that we are, our profession kind of makes it pretty cynical. Yeah. We kind of lose faith in, sure. in governments, we lose faith in states, we lose right. faith in institutions. But what young children do to you is that you know that you are going to be gone and they are going to be there. Yeah. Now, you cannot afford to be utterly and absolutely hopeless. So, yeah. even an old cynic like me kind of sometimes starts to dream that maybe, maybe uh, things uh, can uh, get better or it, through talking or writing or, or yeah. doing whatever we do uh, that we can probably make like an iota of a difference. And if you'd asked me like 20 years ago, I was like, no, this world is going to, to and tomorrow, Hell and that's a, a good thing. And, and that's, that's a good fine. thing. Because we feel thing. we can handle it, but yeah. you're right. We mm. don't want it for mm. our kids. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Mm. We want mm. like something mm. better. Mm. Well, um, we're going to take a little break now, but we will. Uh, I will be back on this subject shortly. Um, we're going to take a little break. So, uh, but do tune in. <laughs> Welcome back to Dhaka Tribune presents Straight Talk. Uh, Hanif, so I would be remiss now that I have you here if we didn't talk a little bit about uh, the current situation in Pakistan. I don't know how it works in Pakistan, but certainly in Bangladesh, people have an enduring fascination with Pakistan, and Pakistan still occupies a great deal of mind space mm -hmm. within us. So, of course, everyone is quite intrigued and fascinated by the recent ascendance of Imran Khan to the premiership. Mm -hmm. and we're wondering what does that mean? Is that is that a tectonic shift in Pakistani politics or is there perhaps less there than meets the eye? How would you look at something like that? Well, there are mm, two points of view uh, on that. Mm. The first one is that Imran Khan is just a puppet. Uh, right. It's that the army was uh, Pakistan army. Or we in Pakistan call it the establishment. Uh, Indeed. And uh, that uh, they were sick and tired of the, the older political sort of elite. And they wanted uh, somebody who they can control uh, uh, and manage uh, better. And uh, Imran Khan is a manifestation uh, of, this. Uh, of uh, this, uh, this thinking in the establishment. There's another point of view uh, that uh, every sort of 30 years or so, you've had uh, politicians who kind of come in and go like uh, in a revolving uh, door type situation. You had a bit of that uh, in the past. Uh, so people, the electorate uh, kind of also gets bored with them, even sure. if they kind of, you know, don't particularly yeah, hate we, them. But it's like, you know, I've seen you, like, you know, all my life. I've seen you all my life. I've seen you sense, all my life. Yeah, and then course, you have, yeah. and then you have uh, another generation of mm. voters that uh, comes along. Yes. So. So this is one way of looking at it, that Imran Khan came into politics about 21 years about ago. 20 years 20 ago, two 20 decades, two, I think. Two that's decades, about right, yeah, yeah. Two decades ago. And this is for the first time that he's won a national election, election by yeah. a narrow margin, but he has uh, won it. So people who were born when uh, Imran Khan was already in politics, mm -hmm. I think those are the people who have voted him so, as a journalist, I've kind of been around and talked to people during the elections and after the election. So, every single person who has voted for the first time in their life that I have met, it's not a scientific survey. Sure. They right. have whatever their ethnic background, whatever their sectarian kind of uh, uh, alliances, whatever their family background, they've gone out and uh, voted for. Uh, Imran Khan. But I mean. do you feel that, you know, perhaps this mm. is a, you know, it could be like Imran Khan is just sort of one small element mm -hmm. in, 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 the, in the bigger picture, mm. in that perhaps, you know, even though he, he may be who he is and he may mm. be what he is, mm. that perhaps that this has started something and that there could be some kind of a shift in Pakistani politics and even in the Pakistani society to sort of, you know, all of us in the subcontinent, we know, want to move towards a more sort of representative system of government. We want to move mm. towards a sort of a freer mm. uh, system than we have right now. Do you suppose mm. that is something, even if maybe that's not 
mm. what he's about, mm. that somehow, even unwittingly, he could be a catalyst for that kind of change in Pakistan? I, I wish I could agree with you that, yes, uh, the better days are coming. I mean, some people would say that the worst days are, are, coming. are, are, are coming because uh, uh, somehow he's uh, brought about some of those tendencies that we've seen in world politics, we've seen in India. Uh, mm. In India, for example, in Pakistan, like till like five, six, seven years ago, Pakistani liberals, Democrats would always look towards India and say, oh, look at them. They've had sort of democracy consistently. They've never kind of broken from that path. Pakistan has had military interventions. Sort of we have we tend, so, so we, we, we go we back and forth. We have the same uh, history as well. So, yeah. so with that unbroken tradition, hmm. now we look at India with horror. Right. And uh, we mm, look at America, for example, which is kind of the, the, the biggest exporter of the democracy uh, uh, in, the past, in, uh, in the past rights, to, the to the world. Yes. And uh, people look at uh, mm, America with a certain amount of uh, horror when they're not laughing at it. Sure. So, so I think some people say that some of the tendencies of, of, this, of this rabid uh, populism where institutions uh, don't matter, where every critic is a is an enemy of the state, uh, where uh, you uh, sort of unleash uh, your uh, your goons on anybody who kind of stands up to you and says, yeah. "Look, this is not what you said yesterday. Yeah. This is what you know." Sort of. Uh, so I think he and his party and 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 his young supporters, especially, uh, they have uh, uh, those tendencies. And uh, huh. when somebody uh, like me, my age, who's kind of you know come from a certain uh, uh, training and certain background, where you know sort of we all agree that a certain amount of dissent, uh, a certain amount of difference of opinion, is actually a not such thing. a bad thing. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so so people like us are uh, kind of uh, yes, yes. And, uh, and a bit uh, uh, and a bit worried mm. uh, but yes so two things i think on on a s the lev on society level yes certain forces have been unleashed mm -hmm. uh, young people have uh, spoken we may not like what they have to say but right. of course they they but they are the they are the, they are the future yeah. But on that society, you have another old establishment, mm. which is trying to operate uh, with the same rules that, that they operated 20 years ago and 30 years ago. They've, uh, they've modified their, their, their tactics. They are on Twitter and they are on online and they kind of right. monitor you and they, uh, and, and they censor you. So they're using the same methods that they might have used in the 60s and 70s, so do, do whereas we live you know, sort of in, yeah. in, 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 in here and now. Yes, mm. okay. Mm. Well, I'll take a break. We'll come back to that after the break, Hanif, but uh, we'll take a break right now. Hope you will join us after the break. <laughs> Welcome back. This is Straight Talk with Zafar Subhan. I'm in conversation with Pakistani author Muhammad Hanif. Hanif, of course, whoever's in power does make some kind of a difference, whether it's Imran Khan, whether it's the PPP, whether it's the uh, PML. But of course, at the end of the day, um, society, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes has, uh, uh, you know, its own momentum. Culture has its mm. own momentum. The country moves along regardless of who's in power, and perhaps that is a more uh, useful metric of what's going on. So, of mm. course, in Pakistan, you know what's going on right now maybe has you know more to do with uh, you know they're, they're more important players rather mm. than just pa um, Imran Khan being prime minister. Mm. I'm thinking specifically of the Asia Bibi case, which mm. is something you've written about very recently mm. in the New York Times, mm. and I suspect you know that tells us a lot about where Pakistan is as a society right now, whether Imran Khan would be prime minister or someone else. Would it mm. make a difference? Do you no, see? I think uh, you're right. Things kind of uh, move on. In the 80s, we had uh, one of the worst dictatorships uh, mm, uh, in the region. Uh, mm. General Zia al -Haq was around and he sort of brought about some of the most repressive laws uh, mm, regarding uh, women. 
yes. and and their rights and some yes. of those laws still kind of linger on uh, in our constitution and that is what your establishment that is what your government that's what your army that's what your judiciary is trying to do sure and the idea is to keep women behind closed doors they should right. not be seen they should not be heard from ah. but while those laws were there more and more and more and more women have been coming out more women have been educated more women in public life more women in sports more women on the streets because the thing is that you know sort of 50% of your population is women, women. yeah so like the best of your man can't promise that all of you sit home and i will come and feed you yeah. so there is a sort of basic necessity that if right. they don't come out they don't work they don't get education uh, the economy is going to collapse basically right. uh, you cannot feed the country by doing With this only so you can make all you working, can make yes. all the holy laws in the world uh, but you cannot run a country uh, 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 like that uh with asia bibi's case it's it's very unfortunate mm, uh, i think after a very long time uh, pakistani judges took a courageous stand it has yes. been obvious right from the beginning that it was a malefied case some peasant woman in a field have an argument over a drink of water, water. yeah and that leads to a death sentence that's right a Now, charge of blasphemy charge of blasphemy which is very which, which non credible which yeah. is uh, uh, and the case is full of kind of uh, loopholes and uh, yeah. uh, and we've seen many many cases uh, like that and imran khan came out uh, the day the verdict uh, came out the 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 right wing mullahs they kind of you know sort of uh, Uh, threatened the government threatened the army threatened the judiciary and imran khan came out and gave a very very strong speech that this will this cannot be tolerated yeah and of course uh, as he has done many times before two days later he, he went and made around. a deal with this same very sure. mullah who by any law are uh, should be uh, should be in the courts right. if not if not uh, if not in jail behind bars yeah so there is a certain level of tolerance that if you're threatening to use force in pakistan for example yeah and you're using a religion uh, as an excuse to unleash that force against the state that is tolerated the state, we that, have the same thing that yeah. is that is tolerated because because we are people of uh, faith we mm. say the kalama we say allah akbar yeah. now if the person who is attacking us shouts allah akbar much louder it is understandable that there might be some reluctance uh, in our hearts that maybe what if he is a better muslim or mm. if she is a better muslim than uh, than we are now as individuals i can understand that reluctance mm. but i don't know if as a state you are going to discriminate people there are people in in uh, in karachi for example i see these protests there are nurses who haven't been paid they come mm -hmm. out to protest there's a water cannon which kind of shoots at them yeah. there are primary school teachers who come out to protest again their contracts have not been regularized police is out in full force they shouldn't be and i'm not saying the police should go after uh, the the religious parties or they should you know sort of uh, beat the hell out of them uh, but there does seem the, to be a disparity there is there is a certain disparity that if you use religion then you can get away with uh, a lot and i think uh, lots of people in pakistan who are disenfranchised who yeah. have genuine sort of grievances against the state against the society there increasingly uh, sort of realizing that uh, if you if you take this route if you couch mm -hmm. your grievance in this language yes. yes then then you have a better chance of being heard and you have a better chance of uh, getting away with or whatever is it that but you know um whatever the provocation the mm -hmm. uh, advocacy of violence in the commission of violence is something which is a state we should not tolerate but i feel you're right there is a double standard and that's something which i think all of us in the subcontinent need to do a better job on certainly mm -hmm. yeah and also i think increasingly this this uh, this grieved majority uh, the mm. notion of like india is sort of a majority hindu country but yeah. hindus would pretend that as if they are being attacked by sure. you know sort of by minorities uh, similarly pakistan is like you know what 98% muslims uh, mm -hmm. live there yeah. and now suddenly kind of that majority to think that they are somehow under attack by a 
poor Christian woman uh, or, yes, or like, you know, sort of or, 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 a, or, or a literature uh, professor is threatening uh, their, uh, 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 their faith just by sort of sitting in a class and discussing like an old novel uh, yeah. with them. So, I think those notions are becoming uh, acceptable and, and more than religion itself uh, and more than even religious parties, uh, this, uh, this thing that we, the majority actually, we are somehow being oppressed, uh, by being victimized by yes. a tiny, small, uh, insignificant uh, yeah. uh, uh, a minority. Anyway, thank you very much, Muhammad Anif. It has been wonderful speaking with you. I wish only we had more time, but thank you very much. I know it's been, yeah, you've just flown in here from Karachi and you've given us this time and tomorrow you're going to be at the Dhaka Lit Fest and you're going to have to be uh, sort of uh, on song there. So I really appreciate you giving us this time. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.